Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the 210th session of the online optom learning series OLS. And for today's session, we have with us Dr. Maria Walker. Dr. Maria is an optometrist based at the University of Houston College of Optometry. She's an assistant professor and spends her time in clinics and teaching students and doing research. I think that's her most favorite part where she researches a lot in uh, about scleral lenses. Uh, she has fellowships from the American Academy of Optometry and also a fellowship from the Scleral Lens Education Society. Uh, she has been a past president, I think a couple of years back uh, with the Scleral Lens Education Society and was very instrumental and helpful for us uh, as OS. And also the Asian optometrists where we were able to put together a course for scleral lens. It was known as the scleral lens certification course. And that course also contributed uh, 20 points towards receiving the fellowship. And she was one of uh, uh, the speakers there and instrumental to, you know, kind of get this course running with the other eminent speakers. And she's uh, joined us today this morning from her end in Houston to talk to us about some case, uh, cases in terms of scleral lenses. And she's going to take us through what she sees in her practice. So welcome, uh, Dr. Maria, onto our platform once again. And let me just, uh, you know, leave the screen time to you, please. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much. Um, so good, I guess, good evening, probably to most of you. It's morning here, it's Sunday morning at 8 a.m. Um, but good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. It is a pleasure to be back here again. I've done a few of these at this point, um, and they are always fun. I hope, um, you know, I usually talk for about 45, 50 minutes, and then we have time for questions. So it looks like we've got a um, really good audience for this because it's definitely not um, probably a student. I will do a little bit of introductory, um, but but the cases are a little bit more advanced on this one. So it's actually good that there's not any students, although uh, I'm sure that they would benefit as well. But this is more geared towards practicing optometrists and patients that we all uh, have seen usually in one way or another or have potential to see. So before we get started with the actual cases, I did want to take maybe about five to 10 minutes to just kind of go through the overview. Um, I realized that even though we're all practicing optometrists, there's probably some of us that see scleral lenses a lot, and there's others who maybe have only seen them once or twice or even not at all. So I want to make sure that we're all on the same page and I'll also give a disclaimer that, you know, my recommendations for how to fit a lens, what types of exam sequences to do, um, those are specific to what works in my practice. And so I'll talk about uh, maybe potential alternatives, depending on what you have in terms of technology and in terms of um, just capacity of the, the clinical setting that you're in. So there's many scleral lens indications. Our practice here in Houston is very heavy in keratoconus. We're also actually seeing a lot of expansion nowadays into more ocular surface disease. So um, I know I've been seeing more Stevens-Johnson syndrome, so Sjogren's patients. Um, those are the really severe diseased kind of ocular surface dry eye related conditions. There's also this, this other conditions on here, right? So any post-surgical state, post-refractive surgery, post um Certainly post-transplant, a lot of those patients are going to benefit from a scleral lens and, and would be indicated for it if they can tolerate it and if their, their cornea is irregular, right? So it, 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 it maybe doesn't go without saying, but it should. You know, a lot of these patients may, or maybe not a lot, but some of these patients may not actually need a contact lens, right? We know that there's some that do okay in glasses. So don't worry that you're not treating a patient well if they can see well and are accepting the, the vision that they get in glasses. It, it definitely happens. Um, but I would say probably at least about 60% of patients, certainly in this um, left-hand column, which is irregular cornea, uh, is going to need a contact lens. The other indication, and well, actually the first case we'll talk about today, is actually a high myopia case. 
And so if you have high prescriptions, I'm actually a minus seven and I have mild EBMD. So I have my periscleral lenses that I wear. So there's a lot of people that can kind of fall into this high RX and, and other category. Um, Today, the cases that we'll focus on, we'll do a high myopia case, a couple keratoconus cases, and then a, actually it's not specifically on here, but it would fall into the ocular surface disease category, which is neurotrophic keratopathy, which is um, sort of long-term damage or, or short-term, but damage to the nerves. And we'll talk about uh, why that's indicated for scleral lens where when we get to that case. So got a scleral lens patient in the chair, right? What types of considerations just in general are we going to be making, right? So first is what condition do they have? Are they a young person with keratoconus? Are they a, I had a patient the other day, a very young person with Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So uh, how you treat a you know, eight-year-old versus an 88-year-old obviously is going to be uh, different in what conditions they have, right? Here's a patient that has pretty severe disease. This is a 17-year-old girl uh, with Stevens-Johnson syndrome. We actually, um, this was her presentation to us. You can see based on her conjunctiva, it's very scaly and rough looking, it's kind of classic of what SJS will look like years after the actual incident has occurred because they don't, their conjunctiva goblet cells are basically atrophied. And so they can't produce the, the mucus and the other tear components that they need to keep that surface healthy. Um, so that's a very different approach than say this relatively kind of white, quiet eye. And this is a keratoconus patient that's about 22 years old. Um, they're a lot easier fit than this top patient. And you know, considerations such as, do we want to cover, and we actually refit this top uh, Stevens Johnson's patient to cover more of the surface of that conjunctiva to see what we can do. She, again, she's only 17 years old to potentially rehabilitate that conjunctiva. And so she's a, a new patient. We haven't yet um, gotten her uh, into the into the larger lenses. But, you know, the approach has to be a little bit different in terms of who you're considering as your patient. It's lots of patient behaviors can influence scleral lens, uh, where I won't really go into that type of stuff here in this lecture. We're going to more focus on the actual uh, management of the cases, but I, I have to mention something about patient behavior, patient characteristics, anatomy, dexterity, um, not to mention accessibility, right? Do you have access to costs? What's the insurance? Do you have access to lenses? Do you have, um, you know, is the patient able to come in for a a few different visits because it often takes uh, several visits to get these completely successful. So a lot of things that you're considering when the patient's actually uh, in the chair with you. Now, once we're actually fitting, <clears throat> fitting the lenses, you essentially have three different zones and every company is going to have their slightly different terminology, but essentially you have a central zone, which you want to clear. That's the corneal zone. So you can see in this middle image here, this is an optic section, that very first point of reflection. So that very, very bright line of reflection, hopefully you can see my mouse here, um, is the actual um, front surface of the lens. So that's going to reflect light. And this is when you have your like perfect optic section. So you can kind of gauge the depth. This dark area behind that initial very bright reflection is the actual lens thickness. That green area, which in this case looks very uniform and looks um, looks like a well-fitted lens, is the actual tear reservoir. So we call it the fluid reservoir. And that's where you want to, that's your central zone where you want to be clearing over the the cornea so that you have enough clearance and also so that um, you're clearing that point that's the highest elevation. And we'll see in the keratoconus case, it can be uh, that point of highest elevation um, can be much higher. This is, we're looking at a normal cornea in this image. If you have a keratoconus cornea, you can also often get this kind of um, peaked, right? They have that ectasia in the inferior area. So it can be um, impactful on scleral lens fitting. Um, in that limbal clearance zone, and if you look at this image all the way to your left, you can see sort of the glow of the fluorescein underneath the scleral lens. And of course, it's landing here on the 
periphery, you can kind of appreciate these um, blood vessels, those sort of dark lines coming through the bottom of the lens, undisturbed, that's good. Um, but here I'm looking at the, the cornea, including the limbus, and I see that there's fluorescein that covers not only the entire cornea, but I can tell it's covering the limbus as well. Um, and and usually when I, when I teach, I say, you want to sort of have a tapering clearance throughout the, from the central to the peripheral cornea. So you don't want to clear completely the same central to periphery. You want it to gradually taper. And it's honestly hard to appreciate in any of these, these images here. Um, but for those of you who have fit lenses, you'll know what I'm talking about, how the lenses are designed to get less clearance as you get towards the limbus. So while you do want to clear the limbus, you don't want to clear the limbus by so much, by the same amount as the central cornea. You want it to just sort of what I usually tell students is to align it, right? They just almost have like a feathery touch at the very, very edge of the limbus. That way it goes into to a nice, even, smooth landing on the the or on the sclera, rather. Otherwise, if you have a lot of limbal clearance, you're you you either don't land until the very, very edge of the lens, which then will impinge the area of landing, or you land so sharply onto the conjunctiva that you impinge the area, sort of, you know. It, a little bit inside of the very edge of the lens. You can see on this right hand image here a lens that looks um, that looks pretty good and, and blood vessels are uninterrupted going through um, to the to the conjunctiva. I'm going to kind of skip through these. I, I'll talk more about the scleral lens management sequence um, when we're actually doing the case, but that's just an overview of looking at the different visits and the different things that we look at. The one thing I will show before we move on to the cases is looking at the scleral lens health, right? So you have these visits where you dispense the lens, where you follow up with the lens, where you make changes to the lenses. Um, and then once once I've basically finalized the lens, and I'll talk about this in the context of cases, um, but essentially my, I have one more visit where I want to look and make sure that the health of the eye um, is, is maintained. And so you can see this video that's playing here is an image um, of after lens removal of the staining pattern. You can see there's kind of some staining on the conjunctiva where the lens edge was. If I go back to the beginning of that video here, you can see that there's some non-specific. we usually call this bogging staining. Um, and again, we'll, we'll look at a, a case and kind of, and by the way, this is kind of a normal staining pattern that you might expect after removing uh, a scleral lens. And if you look at some still shots of those, um, um, you can see what I mean. There's kind of this bogginess of the conjunctiva or of the uh, corneal epithelium. And you can see as you move out to the limbus, it's not unusual to see um, sort of this fluorescein, again, bogging that um, is not something that I, I worry particularly about, but um, it is something that I monitor and I look at and um, we'll see what we get into today. We may or not, um, get it, get to dive too deep into the, the, you know, staining patterns and, and what's exactly normal, what's exactly not. What I will say is stain and look at the cornea before you dispense any lenses. That's by far the best way. And then you get your baseline data and you can see how the staining patterns compare in, in, uh, after you initiate scleral lenses. Usually uh, it will improve, but it definitely will look different. So kind of understanding and appreciating that can be, can be helpful. Okay, again, lots of different indications for scleral lens wear. Um, and like I mentioned, the first one we'll do is a, it's a high myopia, but it's also, um, and actually maybe she just, I don't even think she had high myopia. Forget that. Uh, I think she's just a multifocal example here. Um, but oftentimes probably my, uh, my mind going where it usually does, which is most of my multifocal sclerals, the ones that come in just for multifocals are in the high myopia range. Cause that is definitely, um, a prescription that tends to appreciate the optics of the scleral lenses. Um, so this is a patient who actually went to get LASIK about a year ago, but was denied due to dryness. Uh, her per current prescription, um, oh yes, I knew she had something that was a little bit funny with her prescription. So she was a high toric, right? So these patients, especially you get up to three or four diopters of astigmatism, um, 
many of our soft lenses these days are pretty good, but um, historically it's been a little bit difficult when you get a higher amount of astigmatism to really get a stable soft lens fit. So she actually came in wearing a corneal GP. So she'd been wearing just spherical corneal GPs um, for at least 20 years at this point. Uh, which would be common for somebody who has not a lot of spherical component, but a lot of sill. Um, and so the first lens we actually tried with her was a bitoric translating bifocal GP. Now, what ended up happening with that pretty quickly is we ordered one lens and then we start talking to her and realized that her comfort was very poor with the lenses and actually had been with her corneal uh, gas permeable lenses for quite some time. And she was reducing her wear time, using a lot of drops. Um, so when we transitioned to the translating bifocal, she continued to have the same comfort issues. So she ultimately, you can see where her cornea looked like here, just straight corneal with the rule of stigmatism. Um, and so a really kind of good candidate for a GP lens, um, for a corneal GP lens, but again, just really was having trouble. And I remember she was denied LASIK due to dryness. So she's got this dryness from the lenses that's probably getting worse as she gets older and her hormones change and she's maybe she always had some discomfort and she just put up with it. Um, so we ended up sort of quickly discontinuing those because um, the lenses look perfect and her vision or her comfort was still not, not adequate. And we started talking to her about sclerals. Um, and so we, um, she was very intrigued by the idea. She had heard about them, very smart kind of um, well-informed person. And so we, we decided to transition into multifocal sclerals. So with scleral lenses, if you need to do multifocality, you can do monovision or you can do multifocal. Um, I tend to always try to do multifocal if I can. Um, a patient who can see 20-20 out of both eyes, has good binocularity, um, and is really wanting good vision in both distances with both eyes. I, I almost always go for a multifocal. It, it usually there was a paper done and there's been other studies as well, but, um, looking at, you know, when well fitted, most patients in my clinical experience matches up with this prefer the multifocal uh, optics compared to mono vision. Now, with scleral lenses, this isn't always the case because a lot of times we'll have, especially with keratoconus, which this is not a keratoconus case, but when you have someone like that, they might have one eye that sees very poorly and the other eye that sees very well, even with a scleral lens. Um, so, those are the cases where you may. Um, um, consider doing more of a monovision or even a modified multifocal monovision combination. But in this case, we decided to proceed with the straight multifocal lens. And the, some of the benefits of that can be, well, first of all, the scleral lenses don't translate, they don't move. Um, so in one sense, you're, you know, you don't have a lens that you can put the optics in the bottom, like a translating GP. However, you have very stable optics. And so you do use stable simultaneous vision optics. Um, it's, it's added to the front surface powers of the lenses. Most of these optics, so it's going to be those concentric circle sort of a center distance or a center near small sphere, maybe one to two millimeters in width, and then going, um, you know, a distance ring from there. The nice thing about these um, types of optics and the GPs is it's, you know, the, the um, there's a lot that can be modified, right? So you can modify the size of the near zone. So I think um, some companies, you know, most companies are somewhere in the range of one and a half to two millimeters for that near zone. And then you have distance around that so that a normal person whose pupil is probably going to be three millimeters, maybe a little smaller, though, if you have, a, you know, a bright light environment and a um, an older patient, but um, we tend to find that. So like one and a half to, to two typically works pretty well for 
for those near zone sizes. And you can also decenter. So that's kind of an essential uh, characteristic. And so most scleral lenses, and we'll talk about this at the end of her case, but most scleral lenses are going to decenter. So the ability to then offset or sort of decenter the optics of the actual lens to, to combat that uh, can be very helpful. So what we started her with was a small lens. So normal, um, and this was actually an Asian patient. So Asian patients tend to have smaller eyes and, and shallower sags. So you can often get away with a smaller lens diameter. So um, we did a 15-4 with her. Um, if you look at distance power ended up being Plano based on the base curve. But if you look at the, the ads, right? So for the right eye, that was her dominant eye. So on the dominant eye, you would do a lower power in probably a smaller near zone. So we did a plus one, right? She's only 44 years old with a relatively small near zone, 1.5 millimeters. So, and then you also notice here, it says DS, right? So decentered 0.5 millimeters, superior nasal in the lens itself. And so what that does is it offsets the inferior temporal decentration of the lens. So we do that superior nasal um, decentration in most lenses. Of course, you can look at the decentration of the lens. You can look at the pupil. You can see how the pupil decenters when patients look up close. It tends to decenter a little bit more when they're looking up close. Um, so you can investigate all that and make these custom decisions for yourself. Um, but ultimately, you're typically going to have one eye that's dominant, one eye that's non-dominant, the non-dominant eye, which would typically be the near eye is her left eye, little higher add 125 uh, and a little larger uh, near zone. So let's look at what the lens actually looks like on the eye, right? And you can see with this video playing, uh, it looks kind of like a soft lens. And what I like to do is have them look left, right, up, down, kind of zoom in on those blood vessels, right? I'm looking for obscuration of blood vessels. Eye looks pretty white and quiet. Uh, you can see this nice inferior blood vessel kind of moving through without interruption. Um, you can see you might have noticed her torque markers. I won't replay that video so we can move on to, to the other cases, but um, you'll, you'll see, you can see usually if you look when I'm playing these videos, you see little toric markers. Um, and this lens had a toric landing zone. So one was a little bit flatter. Uh, and then 180 degrees away was a little bit steeper so that the lens kind of stabilizes. And most patients benefit, benefit from this because their sclera is a little bit uh, asymmetric anyways. And I think I have a case using scleral topography next. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. Like I said, watch out for lens decentration. So here's an example. And this is this, this is actually this patient here, right? So her lens was, you can tell from the decentration, because if you look superiorly, you see less of the lens versus inferiorly, you see more. So that indicates that the lens is decentering inferior. And in this case, it was temporal. Uh, there was a paper published a couple of years ago that measured sort of the average amount of decentration found about a half millimeter temporally towards the ear and a, a three quarters of a millimeter or so uh, inferiorly. And this can get greater when you have too much vault um, and when you have a lot of horizontal asymmetry. So sometimes designing a toric lens can help center a lens on the eye better. And again, uh, we'll talk more about scleral topography and how you can really, um, if you have the technology, customize uh, a lens even even more than than just toric or quadrant specific. So you know that's kind of a, a relatively basic case. It worked pretty well for that patient, um, and the multifocals, you know, were were relatively easy to fit. Um, of course, the these diseases that um, such as keratoconus and all the post-surgical ocular surface diseases um, can be a little bit more complex. Um, so we'll do the next few cases here, which we'll do in the next 20, 25 minutes will be um, two keratoconus patients, and then there'll be a ocular surface disease post-herpetic patient in between. So the, the first case, um, so this is 
also a relatively straightforward um, case to start with. So a new KC patient comes in. So a new keratoconus patient comes in, um, 41-year-old female. She was actually recently diagnosed, which is a little bit off for keratoconus diagnosis, particularly you'd uh, expect it in their late teens or early twenties, but she reports that she's had reduced vision for many, many years. So that tells me she's had this for a while, but she just hasn't gotten to the threshold where she really, uh, you know, came in to, to get checked out. She also is a glaucoma suspect. So whenever I have a glaucoma suspect, I'm instantly thinking, okay, I want to make sure my lens fits, you know, as precisely as possible. I don't want to be causing any unnecessary compression um, in the, you know, landing area, because of course that's overlying most of the drainage structures of, of the eye. Um, she also had a recent gastrectomy, which can affect IOP as well. That's why we kind of note, make note of that. If you look at her topographies here, so if this is her right eye topography, and you'll notice she's already, so this is actually her better eye. Um, this very apical curvature is 62.4. So she's already in the severe category of keratoconus uh, in this case. And you can look at her elevation maps here um, and you can see she's got um, quite a bit of irregular elevation in the posterior surface, but um, in her, her apical surface, she's got basically a difference of about 100 microns from the, the valleys of the cornea to the peaks of the cornea. Now, if we look at her left eye, you can see her, her, mo her greatest peak. And actually, before I do that, we can also just mention here her corneal thickness in that right eye is about 425. So this is a pretty typical you know, severe, but I would say, I would call this like early severe. She didn't really, I don't think she had much scarring on this eye. Um, but if we look at this eye, her left eye, definitely her worst eye, her corneal thickness is about 300. Um, and at the apex, it's measuring a curvature of about 88.4. Um, you can see when these maps look like this with this super hot spot here, typically that means, um, you know, they're, they're not only very peaked, but usually there's some, some scarring. There's a lot that kind of gets filled in by the instrument because it can only read um, so much. And if we look at the elevation differences here, she's got well over 200 microns of, of elevation difference from peak to trough. So when I'm doing a new keratoconus patient, if I'm thinking there's just like a soft lens or a corneal GP lens or a scleral lens, I'm thinking, What's my potential for vision? So soft lens is out. And even with her right eye, with that grade of a curvature, really anything over about 50 diopters. And remember, she was at 62 in her better eye. Um, a soft lens is, is, is not going to be as good, certainly, as the others. Um, as far as the corneal GP lens, this left eye really is going to be very tricky to fit anything with, with anything meaningful. And you can see she had an, or you, she had an obvious Munson sign um, on this eye. When you see Munson sign, you can just picture the lens sitting on top of that, that kind of peak. And it usually gets caught under the lids and falls out or is, or is smashing up against the cornea and causing damage. Um, so with these cases, I just go straight to a scleral lens. So I probably, if this, if the the right eye was the worst eye, I might entertain a corneal GP lens. But even then, um, I would say corneal GP lenses maybe are in the zone of like 50 to 55 diopters for me, right? I said a soft lens is less than 50. Maybe corneals can work 50 to maybe 50 to 60 diopters, really over 60 diopters. It's just hard to get a fit. And this was just such a slam dunk scleral case because she had these big, eyes that would be easy to apply lenses. She really wasn't squeamish about putting anything in her eyes. So you look at all the circumstances around you, but this was definitely a, a um, quick decision into scleral lenses. And if you look at um, the, the left eye here, she's got basically all the signs of keratoconus, right? So she has scarring. You can see scarring. You can see that she has void stria. Uh, maybe not in this particular part of the video, but um, you can also, she's definitely got stromal thinning. You can see as I do an optic section there, um, as you go towards the, the apex, you can see that that thinning uh, and scarring. And she also had Munson's sign. Um, and so this cornea was, was pretty 
uh, pretty diseased. The right eye didn't have a whole lot of signs, which is good because that means you're going to be in better shape when it comes to uh, your visual potential. So in terms of determining the scleral lens to use, right? So you can use just a diagnostic. That's what we did with the first patient. We basically had our lens set. We put some lenses on until we liked the way one fit. And then we did an over fraction. Then we ordered it up from there. In this particular patient, we decided to go empirical um, and scleral topography, especially because of how irregular and different her eyes were. I love using scleral topography. And she was a brand new patient. That's, that's really nice because if you have somebody who comes in wearing a lens, they actually have to wash out and remove the lens for about a day so that you can get a good measurement. So we have, there's three different scleral topographies that we've used in the U.S. We used the um, SMAP scleral topographer in this case, which basically takes an image um, straight ahead, but then it also takes an image in up gaze and down gaze and stitches those images together um, to give you an output that looks something like this image on the right hand side of the screen. And you can see that um, the color map is relatively or is very similar to what you see with a corneal topography. Um, and these blue areas are areas where there's relative depression of the sclera. And then these lighter areas are where there's relative elevation. And so in this particular case, and this is this is just an example. This isn't our patient. We'll see her, her scan in a moment. Um, they had toricity of 412 microns. So um, a pretty cool kind of uh, instrument to use. And here's just an example of how asymmetric the, the sclera can look, um, especially between the nasal and temporal. And just, you, you may have heard me if you've listened to any of my lectures before, I usually have um, this slide in when I talk about scleral shape and scleral topography, um, four categories of shape. And the bottom line here is most of our patients have quite asymmetric scleras. So um, using scleral topography to design lenses can be very, very helpful, um, especially as you get more advanced and see more severe diseased eyes. So again, our patient was brand new to scleral lenses. So if you see here, um, this is what that corneal topography looked like on this right eye. And you can see the scleral topography sort of expands that out and goes on to the sclera. And you can see it will capture corneal data, um, but not quite as accurately as the pentacam, so or as the as the corneal topographies. So we use corneal topography for the cornea, and then we use scleral topography for, for the sclera. When we look at her left eye, you can see you can even appreciate, um, and I said she had months inside, you can appreciate the sort of peakedness of, uh, of her cornea there. And looking at, so we, you basically take the scan, do your overfraction, and then just send that data to the lab and they will design you a lens. Um, so one of the main benefits of this, there's, there's sort of two benefits, but they're kind of part of the same thing is it can design a lens that's very precise. You can see the parameters of her lens here, 16 O diameter, a sagittal depth to the, you know, micron value uh, precision, and then a landing zone that is very specific. And so this particular um, patient indicated a uh, a toricity of 163 microns at axis 80. So essentially this axis here was about 160 microns flatter than this axis here um, away from 80. So very interesting to, um, to look at the, um, the way that this instrument can really precisely design a lens. And so if we look at this video here, and this is a white light video, so you have to kind of look carefully to see the back surface of that lens. And you can see if I throw up an OCT image here, um, we can precisely measure the amount of clearance. So this patient had 218 microns of corneal clearance, um, which is basically right where we want to be. And this was after a little bit of settling. So I usually want 150 to 200 microns of, of clearance after uh, full settling of the lens. And if you look at the landing zone on this patient, and this is really where this um, it, it impresses me is the first lens that 163 microns of toricity just looks 
ideal on this patient. You can actually sort of in this part of the video, you'll see it in the next shot probably. Um, so here's the dot of the lens and then your toric marker is going to be over here. Yeah, you can see that that uh, toric marker there. So that's actually um, 180 degrees away from uh, the, the steep axis there. You can see the other toric marker there. Then we're also looking for unobscured blood vessels. So a success fit on, on that right eye first lens success. So it's, uh, really can cut down on remakes and, um, quite frankly, the work of you as the doctor in terms of really scrutinizing that landing zone and trying to figure out what the heck to design to, you know, have an even landing when you're really talking about a hundred in 60 microns, 100, and you can see this is the left eye, 134 microns. That's 0.1 millimeter. <laughs> like if you think you can even estimate a millimeter, <laughs> I mean, that's, it's, it's a really small um, value. So, I, you know, I can't speak enough. And, and I realized throughout the world, you know, we don't all have access to scleral topography and hopefully that will change as, as we evolve. I think probably most people now have access to a corneal topographer. Um, it's the same in the U S as, as throughout much of the world where most practices still do not practice with a scleral topographer but every year it increases more and more. And I think as um, people, you know, do more and more scleral lens fitting, it becomes more and more practical because it really does cut down on not only the time to fit the lenses, but obviously, you know, these one lens works, works the first time is, is, is really can be huge. Um, especially for those of you that are, you know, managing where patients can't always come back. You have to kind of get a lens, get it fast, get it on and have that work. Um, it's, it really is a game changer. So left eye, and this is the trickier eye, right? So this would have been the eye where I would have been probably taken three or four lenses on my own because it was just so uh, irregular. So again, 16 no diameter, the sagittal depth is much deeper, about, I guess, three or 400 microns deeper than the other eye uh, power there, 134 microns toricity. So the worst eye, you can see as we look here again, we're looking at front surface of the lens, back of the lens. Let me pause this video just for a moment here to get us all on the same page, just in case this is not as familiar to you. Front surface of the lens, then the second reflection is back surface of the lens. Here we don't have fluorescein in, so you just have to be, the, that de second dark space there is the fluid reservoir and then cornea. And so you can see if we go right over the apex of that cornea, um, you can appreciate here, maybe it's, it's, it's faint, but front surface of the lens, back surface of the lens, and then we have our middle area here. And let's see what the OCT looks like on that patient. And you can see here, we've got 186 microns over that very apical part of the cornea. So again, that still falls within my 150 to 200 or 250 kind of sweet spot. Um, again, this is after settling. So this is actually after the patient has come in for the follow-up exam when I've done these done these scans and looked at these. Now, in terms of her landing zone on this one as well, so you can see, again, I go to my sort of lower magnification and lower illumination. That way I can really appreciate um, more the global picture Sure, look at those blood vessels. I'll zoom in if I need to, but here um, it really looks like a, a good fit. And this, you know, doesn't happen every single time, but man, it happens quite a bit that my first lens is the one I end up with. Usually I have to go back with something on the, if I do have to go back, it's something on the refraction. So it's not something on the fit, which uh, is really huge. Okay, moving on, because I want to kind of skirt through, I'm going to go through this case pretty quickly. And then I'm actually, I don't know if I'll honestly have time to go through the last case, but I can at least hit the, the highlights of it. It's another keratoconus case. So this is a neurotrophic keratopathy case. So um, you can see if we want to first look at the topography here on the, the right side, uh, it's a pretty messed up cornea. So this is because, so these patients are often indicated for lens wear uh, because their cornea is irregular due to scarring from a herpetic case. The other sort of, you know, um, also a 
occurring, a, a, you know, issue is that they can't usually feel right. The whole point, the whole neurotrophic by definition, they, they have desensitized nerves, so they can't feel things in their eyes. So it also can act as a sort of protective shield. So even if patients don't have a regular corneal astigmatism due to NK, they also can wear it as a protective device as well. So he only had this in his left eye, um, not going into the, the actual like fitting, fitting, um, at this lens, but ultimately we ended up with a 40, 14.8 diameter lens. This guy had very small eyes and a lot of trouble getting the lenses in. Um, uh, so he ended up with 14.8. He used clear care. He used multi-purpose conditioning solution, and he actually used a preservative free tier application solution. Um, one of our brands here in the U S so in this case in particular, I'm sharing a little bit more information about what he's actually using for his solutions and cleaners, because um, this is a case where he was fit successfully by me years ago, really was a very straightforward fit. His case is more managing the underlying disease in the context of the fit. So here's what he actually looks like when he comes in, um, when, when we look at the lenses. So his eyes are a little hotter, right? They're going to look a little hotter. You see a blood vessel growing right in this area. We'll, we'll see that area more, but his area is the inferior temporal area here. We see all these blood vessels coming in is where he had the, the herpetic infection and still has a lot of inflammation um, that we have to manage. If you look at the fluorescine video, you can see those blood vessels beneath the scleral lens kind of moving into that area that he has. Um, he had the, the disease and still has inflammation and um, uh, essentially inflammation. So if we zoom in a little bit on that there, right? So it's got a little bit of prolapse of the conjunctiva that gets kind of sucked up under the lens. Then you can see these blood vessels kind of coming into an area of his cornea that's hazier. So it's very common if you've had a post-herpetic infection and he tends to get, that's where he tends to get uh, recurrent erosions. And so he has a strict kind of regimen of, of looking at his eye every day to check for redness. And the other thing he checks for is blurriness because wears the lenses. And this is back when he had started wearing the lenses, wears them for six months and then comes in, says I have blur, redness and some discomfort. Now he doesn't have pain um, because his nerves are not functioning, right? So we look at his specular microscopy. It looks fine, right? Because we're looking for edema. So if you look at this, this topography, and this is a corneal thickness topography, you look at him in June, 2029, and actually these are, these are switched, but essentially um, the difference map between October and June is about, it's got about 60 microns of swelling apically. And then in that area where he is diseased, he's got over 200 microns of corneal swelling. So that will cause blur, redness, uh, as well as discomfort. So we have to manage this, this edema with this patient. And this is definitely a high risk for edema population. Um, so there's kind of a couple different things to think about, right? We can think about uh, lens thickness, lens decay. Um, I've got this graph here because it's like there's, um, there's some data showing that you kind of get a lost ROI, right? The ROI is what we call like return on investment. So oh, after you get over 100 DK, this data would seem to indicate it's not going to affect the amount of corneal edema that you have. Um, that's in normal patients, though. That data is from normal patients. So that's important to consider. Um, we also have the flutier fluid reservoir that we can consider in terms of managing edema, right? Because when we see this edema with sclerals, it's because you've got this thick system and oxygen just can't get through to the cornea. I put in application solution um, because, I, again, he's he has wearing, he's using a different application solution, Um so that could potentially affect it. Um, the the take home on on what to do with these patients is create a lens with a DK as high as is possibly available. Um, keep the thickness of the lens as low as possible, and take your fluid reservoir down um, as low as you can. So in this particular case, how we managed him, first thing we did was increase the DK of his lenses to two hundred. Right, his initial lens had a DK of one hundred. 
So we increased it to 200 and we actually had about a 50% reduction in edema. So boom, one easy change, totally improved our outcome. Fluid reservoir thickness was still about 300 microns and he was still having some subjective intermittent blur. So what else did we change? So we ended up changing uh, the corneal, um, the, the fluid reservoir thickness. So you can see from this OCT, it's got a very thin fluid reservoir uh, thickness here. So only about a hundred microns. And you can see his cornea uh, is very irregular here where he's got some scarring and some thickened epithelium. Um, and so basically he's got a hundred microns of clearance uh, with a 200 DK lens. Um, so he's got about a 75% reduction in edema. You can see if you look at the difference map, it, you might be able to appreciate these numbers, maybe not. But if you can, he's actually got zero change in the central, right? So it's not the central that we necessarily worry about with this patient. It's this area inferior temporally where he has the, the diseased area where he's still at about 30 to 40 microns of swelling. But we, we tolerate that. And then he monitors for blur. He also monitors for redness uh, and removes intermittently. Now, like I said, this is a neurotrophic keratopathy patient. So he also has trouble with actually feeling his eye. So another complication, this is a totally different day with this patient, was you actually can probably appreciate, if I go back to that video, you have this hyper kind of reflective area. It's kind of hard to tell what it is. From here, you can probably appreciate it from right about this angle right here. He actually will get a bubble in that area. So he developed a bubble in that area. And you can see when we remove the lens, he's got staining and redness and hyperemia in that area. So lots of things to consider in these types of very diseased eyes. And you just have to kind of take it day by day. But I would say the bottom, bottom line with these guys are they can't feel anything, um, but they can see, they can observe redness and they can observe blur. Those are the two things that are going to change if they're having a problem. Um, but I think without scleral lenses, we see these complications a lot more in these patients. I have a patient who's a young NK patient who was having really severe, severe um, uh, erosions and recurrent erosions because she can't feel the, you know, and so just blinks anytime she rubs, she would get an abrasion. So, um, fitting her in scleral lenses was, was a real game changer. But, um, if you do have these and you can see here really well, you get these blood vessel frongs that he got here. Um, so we treat with broad spectrum antibiotics and return to clinic every couple of days until they're healed. And then um, this patient stayed out of the scleral lenses and went back in when it was resolved. Some patients actually will need to wear the scleral lenses um, with him since he has issues with getting bubbles. We said for you, since the scleral lens caused this uh, issue, let's discontinue it and, and then we can resume wear um, when you're done. Okay. So I apologize. I do not think I will get to the keratoconus case. I know if I even start mentioning anything about it, I'll talk for another 10 minutes. So um, we'll save that for maybe the next time I come on. It's just another keratoconus. We got one of the keratoconus cases in. So with that, I think that's probably a good time to maybe wrap up and thank you for your time. And then we've, you know, I'm here for questions. We'll see if we've got any and go from there. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Maria. I mean, very interesting cases and uh, really, I think it, it makes us think that scleral lenses do work uh, wonders for these patients, right? Even, not only for vision correction, but also for therapeutic measures. I mean, the second case, uh, what you shared with us. So thank you so much for, for your uh, sharing today. My pleasure. And the important thing... Uh, uh, I think probably to just start, if you can reinitiate uh, the protocol. I mean, you did mention that the protocol might be different on what uh, based on the instruments and the facilities you have. But let's say you have a patient. What 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 is the flow of examination? Probably you can just talk sure. about that a little bit. Yeah, sure, sure. And um, and I know I kind of skipped over those slides. So if anybody wants wants those just as like text, please feel free. I'm happy to send them to you. But so basically I have 
the so you have your initial visit right where you're going to collect your baseline data you diagnose the disease if it hasn't been diagnosed right we all know how that general intake goes you're going to fit at that exam um and actually i'll i'll even comment because sometimes there's so much to do that first page that first time you see the patient um sometimes my students will We'll say, okay, let's do everything else and then have them come back for the fitting. I do not do that because you want to get that fitting done first so that you can order some lenses and kind of move forward with that. The other stuff, the, you know, pupils, dilation, all the health stuff, you can do that at one of the, one of the later visits. So I say they're coming in for lenses, get them in the lenses as soon as you can. So you're going to fit at that visit. Then you'll see them back maybe one to two weeks later or one to two months later, depends on where you're getting your lenses from and how long it takes to get them. But basically you time it so that as soon as the lens comes in, they obviously can come in. That second visit is only application removal. I mean, it's, it's get the lens on, make sure it fits, make sure it's adequate. If it's, if the vision is better than it is without you're good. If it doesn't have to be perfect, if the, if the fit looks okay and it's not like mashing against a cornea or getting bubbles in it or some, you know, if it doesn't look horrible, dispense the lens, get them started wearing the lens. And that's again, that second visit. So first visit fitting the lens, second visit training. And one thing I always get on students on is don't go crazy on your over fraction and assessing the fit for an hour at that second visit. As soon as it's tolerable, have the patient start working on application removal. That can take time. You want to focus on that because as I always say, like you're not going to get anywhere if the patient can't get their lens on the eye. You can have all the over fractions in the world. If you can't train the patient, you're, you're stuck. So that's, and I even start at that first fitting visit. I'm explaining everything I'm doing to the patient. I'm explaining how I'm putting the lens on. If they've worn lenses before, I might put the first lens on and even have them put the second lens on straight away just to get them used to it. So, and then I also, as an aside, I give them homework of go online, go to the SLS, go to, oh, you know, go wherever you can find it and watch videos of people putting these things in. Right. So then that second visit is focused on application removal training, get them started wearing the lenses. Then I see them one week later. Right. So we've had fitting a few weeks or months later, dispense week or two later, a follow up visit. How are you doing with the lenses? How's application? How are your cleaning solutions? That's when you want to do a really good over a fraction because they've been wearing the lenses for two to three months. So you want to really get that data or two to three weeks rather, usually at that point. Um, and then you can see what the lens looks like settled, right? So you're educating the patient, come in after wearing the lenses, come in working, you know, come in with questions, come in having played around with the lenses, been wearing them as much as possible. Um, so ideally in a perfect world at that third visit, you're like, great, these are the lenses for you. I don't see any other things. And then I have one more final visit, which is like maybe a month after that. And then I want to look at, take the lens off, look at the health, look at like this, if there's been any swelling, check in on all those final things. Um, so I've got four visits there. Now, in reality, between th visit three and four, you might have two to 15 visits, <laughs> depending on the patient and depending on how many remakes you have to do. But, you know, if you've got your flow, you know, and you hope to get to the point where you maybe just have two or three visits there where you're maybe you put a little touristy into the power. Maybe you change the landing edge a little bit, um, but you want to, um, yeah, you, you hopefully get, you know, a pretty good lens to start, but it's reality. Wonderful. Uh, just taking up some questions, Dr. Maria. One, uh, I think two of the attendees probably asked a similar question is uh, how would you go about making the vault uniform in terms of, you know, keratoconus, yeah. which is advanced, or you have OSD or yeah. things like that? Yeah, so it's not uncommon that when you have, like in that second patient, or that when that keratoconus patient, right, they, and that wasn't even a, a super severe case of, of differences. But yes, so sometimes you'll have, you might have 180 microns of clearance over the very apex of the cone, which is exactly what you want. But in the periphery, you might have over a thousand microns of clearance because there's just such a difference in the variability of the corneal height. And then you have a lens that 
in reality, with the more the more advanced they get, you'll often get some more decentration of the lens. So there's a couple of different ways that you can approach this. I think getting a lens to center as well as possible can be helpful because um, you know, you'll, you'll tend to have, otherwise you'll tend to, if it's sent, if it's decentered inferiorly, you get a lot of clearance inferiorly. Um, if you have a little bit of a smaller diameter, depending on if you can, I mean, there's a lot of different things you're thinking of, but a, typically a smaller lens will center a little bit better. So you can use that to try to get the best centration. Um, if you have very, the, really the only way to actually get the uniform vault though, to actually answer your question is to do a molded lens. So it's not accessible to probably 90% of practitioners to get a uniform vault. So first thing is don't worry that much about it. There's, it's, we all deal with it. You deal with what you can work with. I've never seen issues with like severe edema in those areas of excess vault. You do get maybe a little more discomfort. Maybe your optics are not quite as sharp as they could be. Um, but if you're like, so if you do a molded design or even those topographies will often have like free form designs that will make it uniform, that will center it more and it'll, it'll make it so that, but, but that's because the center of the lens is asymmetric and, it, and it's free form. So with a standard lens that you're getting that has a spherical or even a torque power, but a spherical uh, optical zone, you're just going to have to accept that if you've got these high asymmetries on the cornea, you're going to get way more vault and you can try to center the lens as well as possible. And that will, um, uh, you know, make it better, but it's put it this way. It's worse to touch the cone of that keratoconus than it is to, as I say, flood the inferior cornea. Um, because I just, yeah, yeah. hopefully that answered it. Okay. Right. Yeah. Because I think, I think I'll, we, we all uh, look in for a textbook kind of picture. You want right. that uniform zone in real yeah. life it would be difficult. So as you said, you don't touch the cornea in that apex part is the most important thing and, and, right. and try to make it uniform. Yeah. Wonderful. A uh, couple of more questions. Uh, this is regarding again, uh, a case of uh, ocular surface disease. So if you have a patient who has conjunctivocalasis uh, and the lens diameter and things like that are not going well, probably due to that. Would you accept the fit if there is a conjunctivocalysis in, in those patients or would you have some recommendations to, to look into it? Yeah, so I see this conjunctivocalysis in most of my OSD patients. Um, mm -hmm. I think because a lot of them have disease of the conjunctiva that makes it more um, pl pliable and more redundant, right? Because it's that redundant conjunctiva that gets kind of sucked up or loose. So I don't know if it's a, I, I would imagine that most of these OSD patients, if they've got conjunctival disease, they it, it's not as attached to the underlying sclera as it should be. So it kind of get, puts them at risk for it coming. So first of all, I see it in most of my patients too. It's sort of similar to the last question where you do what you can and you sort of have a hierarchy of things that matter most to you, right? And so in this case, um, so steep have they change in diameter? Yeah. So I, I'll be honest. I was just having this conversation the other day. If I have a patient who has comes to me with conjunctival prolapse, I don't know if I have any that I've been able to get rid of it completely. I have some that I've gotten to lessen it by like by um, sort of steepening the limbal clearance zone. So bringing that area down, um, and evening it out a little, there is something to be said. Actually, it's interesting in these patients, sometimes they can get, if their fluid reservoir is very thin, it can actually make this worse because they get something called, and I don't know the, I'm not a physicist at all, but it's like a, um, that thin film adhesion forces that will act. And, and Dave, um, not Dave, um, Steve Vincent's group did a, did some work on this. I think with um, Damian Fisher looking at um, that they found that they had more of this chalasis in patients that had a thinner fluid reservoir. So it was like this thin film suction force. 
So in these, I almost would say, I mean, but again, it's like, depends on how much clearance they had. If they only have, they have very minimal clearance, you might be, have a little bit of room to raise that a little bit just to give them a little, but I don't typically raise clearance to, you know, I don't, cause you can induce midday fogging and just other irritations and things. So I would say, uh, let me circle back on this, right? So like lens movement, Okay, that's probably actually, if the lens is moving, that's probably reducing the amount of chalasis. You might have more if the lens wasn't moving, because if the lens isn't moving, it's going to have more suction. So a little bit of lens movement, if they're comfortable, I think that's fine. Again, the most I've seen is I have one patient who like from basically two o'clock all around to 10 o'clock has three, has almost 360 chalasis. We don't like it. Um, but she can't even, you know, she has such severe Stevens Johnson syndrome that she, if she takes the lenses off for two minutes, she can't open her eyes. So, you know, you, you work with what you got, but yes, I, you know, we tell, we, we try to reduce the limbal zone a little bit. You can try maybe making the lens a little bit bigger. Um, but yeah, that, that it's a tricky one, but it's, it's one of those things that doesn't cause, um, we haven't seen it to cause severe damage. I will also say just as one last thing, I have talked to a couple um, corneal surgeons who have sort of said, well, we can surgically bring it back. I've yet to have any patients actually do that procedure because we just worry that, you know, they already have so much disease on the ocular surface. If we then go surgically cutting tissue away is, you know, other tissue just going to move into that place. You're going to damage the nerve. Like who knows, you know, we're, we're very conservative, but we may see that, you know, cauterizing or something happening in the future. If it's patients that have it severe, I don't, I'm not against it, but I'm just cautious. On what, cautious so you, yeah. don't, you don't want to cause more problems than they already have. So. Right. Okay, we'll take a couple of more questions. One, one is uh, regarding the decentration. So what's your recommendation if we have to modify a decenter lens? What would you do first? I mean, yeah, I can, an I can answer this one pretty quickly. So decenter the, the greater vault, greater horizontal asymmetry on the sclera. Those are the two primary drivers of decentration. So you can reduce the vault. And you can create a more toric landing zone that matches up with the sclera. Now, if you don't know, you don't have any, any possibility of measuring the, you know, toric sclera, well, you can put a spherical lens on and see where it, it has clearance and see where it doesn't and kind of get an idea. You can also do a smaller, a little smaller lens because the cornea, it, it, smaller lenses will center better. So sort of a three-pronged approach, right? Lower your clearance as much as you can, create a toric or you know, a more asymmetric compared to the, the decentered lens and reduce lens diameter will help with those. Wonderful. And let me just take this one last question. This is regarding, I mean, since we are talking about cases, have you had any experience of fitting, uh, you know, scleral lenses with, this question uh, focuses on cosmetic, but therapeutic measures such as for aniridia or you know people having yeah. no irises and things like that yeah so. yes so um th this is done i i have never done it so i will tell you that right after that um i so we did there was one the, the real issue with this is if you're doing this um so there are painted scleral lenses um, if you're doing this, the one issue is the decay of the lens. I think we measured, there was one company, I don't even remember who it is, so I won't give them up, but who wanted to know the decay of their lenses after they had painted on them. And it like cut it in half. Like it's, it's really can affect the decay. So I don't know where technology is on that. I'm sure that there's ways to, the obvious thing to me would be to put ink like in the middle of the plastic or something like to somehow do that. Um, I think ink on the front surface of the lens causes issues with, you know, given what we know with soft lenses, ink on the front causes issues with comfort, of course, and also the lens, you know, paint coming off, getting into the eye type of thing. I mean, they're, we're past those issues, but comfort still um, could be potentially an issue. And then de and then just oxygen permeability. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know of a good person that's doing, I know, I think we have someone here in Miami and somebody in Arizona. Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah, I was just remembering it's uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Chauhan. So he does yeah. this. Uh, I think he's the only one probably I know as, as yeah. you say, it's very limited uh, uh, technology in this, but he yeah. does a lot of uh, fancy work in scleral lenses. Yeah. He puts uh, dyes and things like that. So he has yeah. a little bit of patent, but as you said, uh, it is probably something to look at because it affects the decay of the lens. So you need to look at that as well, right? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So I think with that, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maria, for sharing that with us and, uh, you know, uh, spending your Sunday morning with us. Yeah, thanks for spending lenses. your Sunday evening with me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, yeah. you know, sharing and uh, giving us all the insights uh, of the cases you see. Yeah, thank you so much. Today I do have session planned over the next couple of weekends and weekends. Until then, take care, be safe, and I hope to see you during the next session. Bye-bye.